fields by light. So that's what that was about. But he began to lose his eyesight as a teenager. And uh, she said, she said, I won't always be with you, baby. And he said, you're calling me baby. Because you'll always, she said, you'll always be my baby. Isn't that a modernism? You'll always be my baby. But she said, I'll always be with you here. And for God, I'll always be with you. But I won't be with you physically. So you're losing your eyesight. And you are going to have to learn to take care of yourself. So what an interesting, challenging thing for a mother to be able to have to tell that to a child. I love other mother motherisms too that I think of, like the one if you ever told your child, well, if he told you to go jump off a bridge, would you do that too? I used to get that one uh, kind of often. Power of mothers. That's what we're talking about today. The power of mother. The power is in their compassion. The power is in their openness to be able to to. to say that to a child, to say these type of things to a child. Mothers have the power because they bring life. Don't they? they bring life from the womb, which is pretty incredible if you think about it. They also have their power and their creativity to raise a child. Doesn't it take creativity to raise a child? Because you're teaching them. And you mothers and dads out there, can you think of where you had to be extra creative? To get really creative. Where's Linda Black at? Is she here today? She with us back here today somewhere? Yeah, in the back row. I love the story that you don't know that I know about you. Uh, it's not embarrassing. That comes later, but. Uh, of you. Apparently, you had a child that liked to dress up every day. And so you had to actually create patterns and create outfits and new outfits every day to be creative, to keep her, to keep raising her that type of thing. And then, more than that would happen when uh, you decided to cut her hair off as a child. Uh, that was a little bit traumatic for young Amanda here. Uh, her, I can pick on you at your first day to uh, lead off the new platform today, so congratulations for that. And you uh, had your hair cut, and uh, what happened then was uh, you, you weren't functioning very well. You didn't like it, so you, kind of came up, you guys came up with creative ideas to let her seem like she had long hair, including wearing a long towel. <laughs> so she would wear, she would actually go to church or wear it with a long towel around her head. So <laughs> not Yeah, yeah. As you can tell, we've also had a little bit of issue uh, with uh, long hair. And what was the other thing? Oh, she made you a wig out of yarn. So when, when do I get to see these pictures of you wearing a wig with yarn? That would be uh, pretty awesome. It was a very good year of a smile. Girls on the village green, we laugh and we sing. It's always mother energy happening around the globe. So as you pray and as you do get quiet with God today and beyond, also give thanks for that. To say, you know, hey, our world nurtures life also. Isn't that interesting? Mother Earth. So let's uh, celebrate that today as well. I saw an advertisement the other day that it said, uh, test drive the new Corvette around the world, something like that. And it said, what could be a more, the new Corvette Z06 2015, what could be more wow than that? And a couple of our guys in the audience, yeah, I'll do that, I would take that on. But I am here to tell you that maybe one thing more wow than a test driving a Corvette is the mother upside down, the mom upside down. Moms have so much wowing power, so much wow. There's nothing more wow in my life than what I've seen with mothers. And you are the one, Sandy, that told me and reminded me that it was wow upside down. And I said, well, what about you? What are some of your wow moments? And four generations here at Unity for this family, four generations which is pretty awesome. And uh, yeah, it sounds like you, some of your wow moments involve the fact that um, your mother was a, a stickler for being on time. So could be, she's laughing. Could be 30 minutes early, but don't be a minute late. 
Well, at some point in uh, Sandy's teenage career, around 15, 16, she decided it was time, her and her brother decided that it was time to make new pictures for her mother for a present. Because the last pictures of them, her mother was carrying around in her wallet from when she was like two or three years old. So it's about time to, to give an update. So what a great gift that would be. So Sandy came up with a good excuse to borrow the car, like teenagers do. They need an excuse to borrow the car. So came up with an excuse, but mother said, what time are you going to be back with that car? And Sandy said, here's what time I'll be back with that car. And then they smuggled clothes into the closet, into the trunk. For, to, for the pictures, smuggled the clothes in there, took off, got to the photographer, and like some photographers <clears throat> can be, as a f- photographer myself, it takes them much longer than they predict, much longer to, uh, time to get these portraits done, and it took like, what, extra two hours to get it done, and they knew they were going to get in trouble, they knew they were going to be in big trouble to do this, so on the way home, they're weighing the odds of trouble versus the gift, <laughs> that, that scale, what, what's going to be more worth it? to complete the mission with this gift or to get grounded, and guess what they chose? Well, they got grounded for a week before it finally came time to give the gift and of the pictures. And I guess after that, they weren't grounded anymore, right? After you found out what, what, what it was about. And then it was like 15 years before you actually got pictures taken again, after that 15 more years. And did you get grounded then? Yeah. <laughs> So it works in reverse too. There's a way that mothers wow us, but there's a way that uh, our children wow the mothers in that situation. And we're also gonna have a couple of my actors come on stage right now. And we're gonna see yet another way how this happens. So let's see if any of you can identify with this. A little situation here. It's the different uh, paradigms and the different perceptions that we have that we go through life. Certainly every Sunday we talk about that. Maybe you had a different perception when you were younger or even last week about what God means to you in your life, about what it means to walk with spirit and be guided by spirit and be nurtured by spirit. That's what we talk about here. But certainly that growing up process with the family Uh, is a beautiful testimony to all of that, of how our perceptions change. So here we have two uh, uh, representatives of what children may say. And here's what, it's titled, Mom, I Love You. Mom, I Love You. And here's the first mother, the first child saying, Mother, I Love You, at age 10. I love you, Mom. She gets a little older. She reaches those years, those interesting, that phase, those challenging years of a teenager. And here's what she may say at age 14. Ugh, my mom is so annoying. <laughs> so you have to go through that for a little bit of time. Can I have a couple amens on that? Mothers, you may know how that's gone. Okay, so then all of a sudden, as a mom, you're thinking, oh, if I can only get her grown. If I can only get her 18 and out of here, out of the house, or for a little while, and here's what she might say at the age of... I want to leave this house. That's what she says at 18, yes. Then she gets a little bit older into adulthood, maybe beginning to start a family of her own. At age 25, she begins, after having her, starting her own family, she may say something like this. Mom, you were right. (laughs) 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 then get a little wiser a little bit older and that magical age of 30 comes around mom forgive me (laughs) say jesus forgive me i knew not they, they know not what they do then that beautiful year when you're really beginning to figure it out and you get wiser and all of a sudden before you know it you find yourself at 50 years old i don't want to lose my mom yeah yeah then the years pass begin to get grandchildren of your own and then at about age 70 
Mom, I love you so much. Yeah, give him a hand. Yeah. Mm. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Age 10, I love you, mommy, I love you, mommy, and then it kind of circles back to where it started. I believe the choice to become a mother is a choice to become one of the greatest spiritual teachers there is, to create an environment that's spiritual, stimulating, nurturing, to pass on a sense of responsibility to another human being, to let that person know that they are capable of creating and being anything that they want. What is more honorable than that? What is more honorable than that? And I think moms get a little bit of a raw deal sometimes and they don't get the credit that they deserve for raising, uh, for raising children. They get a little bit of credit in Proverbs. This is one of my favorite uh, Proverbs, Proverbs 30, 31, 25, where it says, she is clothed with, clothed with strength and dignity and she laughs without fear of the future. So, figuratively speaking, saying that this applies to mothers and the character that, uh, that they have. It's also, guys, Nurses Week. Do you know that? Uh, nurses Week. So I thought I'd do a little tribute to nurses because also mothers, what mother has not had to be a nurse? What mother has not had to be nurturing, understanding, responsible, smart, and extraordinary? Had to be all of those things. And I may have told you before, but I am a man of many mothers. That's what I'm told. And if by what they mean is I've had different people care for me, love me, nurture me, be smart, responsible, understanding, and nurturing, then that's absolutely true. Although not all of them gave birth to me, obviously. Uh, the, the lady who did give birth to me, I am very thankful for that. But unfortunately, because of mental and physical issues that she had and challenges, she could not raise me. That became painfully obvious when one month after I was born, she left me in the apartment with no lights, no electricity, no power, and left. Miraculously, two agents from the uh, welfare department came by for a surprise visit, knocked on the door, the door opened a little bit and they heard a baby screaming inside. So they came on in to this cold, dark place and found me in a box wrapped in a beach blanket on the kitchen table, screaming. Still with the wristband that I had around my wrist from when I was born. They took me away from there and my life got very interesting at that point because I got to be placed with my next mother, my foster mother. And her name was Mama Carol, is what everybody called her. Mama Carol had a very interesting way of communicating. Very exuberant woman. And she used what some of you have heard me call Southern Proverbs. That's how she raised her children, with Southern Proverbs. And so, you know what Southern Proverbs are? Now, you've all heard of biblical Proverbs, Chinese Proverbs, ancient Proverbs. And you spin all that together, wrap it together, put some Southernisms in there with it, and you get Southern Proverbs. And one of my favorite ones, you've heard me maybe say one time before, if you were to cut your finger, Mother Carol would come up and go, Oh, honey, chicken ain't nothing but a bird. <laughs> If somebody tells you chicken butter, you know, you walk away going, what, what does that mean? But what she meant was, you're going to be okay. You're going to live, be tough. Don't be a sissy. Get out there. And I dare you. I double dog dare you on the way home today. I hope you don't get pulled over by the police thinking about Mother's Day and the fact that maybe you haven't bought a gift yet. Uh, and the police pulls you over and says, uh, why are you driving so fast? And you look up and you just say, wow, chicken ain't nothing but a bird. <laughs> and see how that works for you. Yeah, yeah, they'll put you in the cookie truck. Let me know how it works. Try it, I don't know. It'll be good. After a while, oh, well, I have to tell you the most powerful proverb that Mama Carol ever gave. And this is true because I got my adoption papers later on. And I remember part of it. I couldn't remember exactly what she said, but I remember her doing this right here to my head, to my heart, that right there. And she would say, you got to bushwhack them. 
Who knows what a bushwhackum is? I had no idea either uh, at three years old. My three-year-old self did not know that she meant you got to bushwhack all those negative thoughts, all that fear that you got in here is what she was saying. And then when she would say, after you bushwhack him, you got to connect your head to your heart. You got to travel the longest journey in the world to go from your head to your heart. And she believed that. That was her mantra. And that's what she would say all the time. Isn't that incredible advice? Every, it seems like every spiritual counseling session I do, every counseling session I do, somehow it gets back to that advice that I got. Because we can be so in our head trying to figure out our life, trying to figure out our challenge, trying to figure out relationships, trying to figure out what went wrong in our past. Fear of the future, all this type of stuff, as opposed to traveling that journey and getting right here where God is, getting right here into our heart. And that's what that advice was about. When I was about three three years old, I got adopted by my mother of all mothers, Maggie Mother Shed was her name. Maggie Maggie Mother Wow Shed is what uh, she could be called. And apparently it took lots of Southern Proverbs to raise me uh, as well. And and she certainly came up with those. And I, I certainly miss her today. This is my first day to uh, be without her, or my first Mother's Day to be without her after she passed this past year. But the one thing that she always had, the one thing I always remember her for, what I carry with me today is this quote that we found right here. No language can express the power, beauty, heroism, and majesty of a mother's love. She loved kids. And she helped me take that journey from here to here by setting an example. And that's really what our, 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 our job is when we try to have impact with others in this world and to do uh, what Jesus said, to do what our waste shower said. Jesus had a little help too, didn't he? He had a little help too. Uh, all through scripture, uh, what his mother and the encouragement that his mother would give and um, including the story of his first mi- miracle is found in John 2, 1 through 4. On the third day, there was a wedding. It took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. And what did he say? Being you know, our way show, or you would think he'd be like, okay. You know, instead he said, dear woman, <laughs> why are you telling me about this? Jesus replied, the time for me to show who I really am isn't here yet. Well, how many times in our lives that we felt like we weren't ready yet, that it wasn't our time yet, and it took a little nudging from mother to say, you are ready, you can do it, you're capable. And you know what? You're capable and you listen to spirit to do the next right thing is what it's about. And if you uh, don't bother taking time to listen, then uh, she'll tell you what to do and it'll be all good. And of course, Jesus went and did that first miracle right there. Uh, Well, I always think about that when I'm reading stories or I'm thinking about my own life. You know, I'm not ready yet. I'm just not ready yet qualities to go from here to here to the mind to the heart are like physical qualities they're developed by exercise they're developed by uh uh you know um just doing it and to put these things that we study these spiritual practices and prayer life in to use and sometimes something happens in your life that forces you to acquire those qualities to exercise it You may be going along and devastation strikes and that forces change. It forces you to do something a little bit different. It forces you to change that perception that I mentioned earlier. Some of us got to go to the CAN uh, Conscious Awareness Network meeting this Wednesday where we got to hear from this lady, Kathy Sanders, who's written this book. And what a story of a mother and a grandmother overcoming. And we're gonna have her Uh, We're planning, we're we're working to get her to be able to speak here in June because I want you to hear her story. It's powerful. 
It's intense and it can change the way that you forgive in your life and the way that you see things in your life. And I'm not going to tell the whole story, but I'm just going to give you the over, the synopsis. When she, uh, when the Oklahoma City bombing happened in 95, uh, her, uh, Kathy and her daughter were just down the street a couple blocks away. They heard this loud explosion, this boom. And they didn't know what it was. They walked outside of their building and saw smoke everywhere and looked down the street. And they start running in that direction because minutes before that, they had put their two, Kathy had put her two grandbabies in the daycare at the federal building. So they saw that it was coming from the federal building in Oklahoma City. So they ran, they ran there just yelling, my babies, my babies. And they get there and they see that half the building is gone. And they frantically began to search and look for survivors. And eventually the police and firemen made them get away. But they went for hours not knowing for sure what had happened. As time went on, of course, they found uh, Timothy McVeigh and then Terry Nichols, the, the uh, people that did it. How would you feel? How would you feel if that happened to someone you love, if it happened to your grandbabies? Well, that's what this story is about. How she would be able to overcome, not just overcome it, not just finally to be able to get forgiveness, to be able to put a song in her heart again, but to actually become friends with the mother of Terry Nichols. So it's an incredible story. But it shows that inner reserve of strength and power and compassion that's available for everyone. And I want to tell one more story is, you know, um, the, our movement began with Charles Fillmore and Myrtle Fillmore, our co-founders. And here is one more person that I would just want you to know today, that his mother also overcame lots of hardship. He had, uh, at, a, at, a, at about 12 years old, he hurt his leg to where it stopped growing and he ended up with a leg four inches shorter than the other. And the doctors tried everything to get rid of the disease. They leached him, he said. They blistered him, they bleached him, they seasoned him, they, uh, all these words uh, they came across. And they actually put six sores into his leg to try to pull the poison out of, of his leg. So he went through all of this, but the boy did not know how to give up. He didn't know how to give up to the sickness, to the poverty, the discouragement, but it was his spirit of his mother that encouraged him and said, you know, I may not be able to, uh, I may not be able to have the power to stop the infection in the leg, but we do have the power to stop the infection of your spirit. Now that's pretty amazing. That's a pretty amazing story because we probably wouldn't be here today having this conversation if it wasn't for that one mother because they were very poor in a cabin in Minnesota and um, they overcame that. So I want to give you your Mother's Day gift today. This is the last thing I'd like to talk to you about. You know you're going to get your gifts over here. You know you're going to get your, your roses and everything before you leave. But here's the roses. I, here's the gift I want you to take that will keep on giving. And the first thing is to realize that the real gift you can take today, when you think about your mother, whether she was perfect or imperfect, she was the mother in your life. That's the true gift. Compassion, love, and all the things that mother stands for. So I hope you'll give that some energy and some time and some prayers about that. Number two is the journey. The longest journey you will ever take is the journey of 18 inches between your head and your heart. Yes, I lost my mother, but when I take that journey now, I think about what she stood for. I think about the gift she gave me driving down to the general store last fall on a beautiful fall day. We drove. She always sits in the back seat because she insists that somebody else has to sit in the front seat, just in case. She had gotten Alzheimer's. So we drove to the general store, and she was gazing out the windows, looking at the beautiful changing leaves, just looking. I was kind of watching her with worry in my heart because, you know, of what was going on with her. But I was watching her in the rearview mirror taking mental pictures, mental snapshots. And uh, finally, she breaks the silence and she looks over at me and she says, I'm proud of you, son. I'm proud of you, son. 
And that was amazing. And right then I bushwhacked <laughs> all that worry and fear I had. And in that moment, I traveled that distance of 18 inches right there. Of course, then she turns around a little bit later and says, and God ain't done with you yet. I hope that each of you have somebody to take that distance, to travel that distance of 18 inches with and be that person to help someone else travel that distance also. It's not going to be a perfect journey, but it can be a journey that mothers stand for, a journey of love, compassion, and 18 inches. Thank you. Namaste. Mother who 